This is the coolest in the whole world, by the way. We have a very special guest today. We are part of the 3D concept team that works in The Mandalorian season one and two. How many people work on this? It was one person. Wow. As best as you can, start to finish, how do you make this shot? Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's episode. Stick around to the end to find out how you can get 15% off your pair of premium wireless earbuds. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artist React. I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. Felix George is on the couch with us today. Can you tell us about your background? I am the CEO and creative director at Happy Mushroom. Our current focus is in virtual production for environmental design. We are part of the 3D concept team that works in pre-production, designing The Mandalorian season one and two. I think traditionally people think of virtual production and they think of mocap suits, but we think of environments. We think of lighting. We think of photorealistic assets. Maybe you would just even sum it up as simply like using game engines for your final image. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to hear all your insights, so let's get started. So the big predecessor John Favreau directed to The Mandalorian was The Jungle Book, and it has a lot of the same technology minus the actual volume stage. I was heading the environment team for all the pre-production on this, and we had a team of 12 people, 12 environment artists, and we were using Unity still. Okay. So this is a Unity project. One of the major similarities with Jungle Book and The Mandalorian is that we had lighters, lighting environments with the DP months prior to the shoot. So he was actually involved with lighting all the sets. So by the time they get to the shoot and he has to influence the shoot and how it has to be lit, he already had all his information. This was a complicated scene because they wanted him to be able to react to the bear. I do remember seeing a behind the scenes shot of this yeah. where Mowgli was like sitting on something and Jon Favreau was actually in the water interacting with them. But then it is all replaced. Also notice how Mowgli's actually sitting on a real bear prop with that wet fur so that you don't have to really worry about that, mm. that contact interaction going on between yeah. Mowgli's skin and the, the real fur there. Have you guys seen the, the other Mowgli movie? Oh, the Andy Serkis one? The pack needs you, Mowgli. This one came out shortly It after... kind of came out around the same yeah, time. Yeah, it was very close. I speak for the cub. We have one. God, this one, the eyes though, kill me in this one. They're human eyes on animals. Oh. What is going on there? That is so it's, weird, you're I right. Know. It is. It's, it's like, it doesn't matter how good everything looks because the eyes are like- Hard to look away. It's because I think the animals were actual like motion capture performances from people. So I think they were trying to replicate the emotion behind the eyes in these animals. That's the, the eternal problem with trying to do animals that emote, right? You gotta like find the balance between being able to convey emotion that humans understand, AKA like facial motions and whatnot, but also still maintain the fact that it's an animal. That was the problem that they had on the Lion King movie that Jon Favreau did. Mm -hmm. they, they tried to like give these animals emotion, but also never depart too far from the fact that they are still animals. I think Jungle Book did a better job than both of them. Jungle Book was not trying to be super hyper-realistic with the faces. I mean, it was photorealistic with everything else, but they had a level of emotion that I enjoyed. It's very hard to fake light and shadow. And so everything became about using panels of LEDs to project lights. So the eventuality of that workflow manifests in The Mandalorian. And we've talked about Mandalorian before. Awesome show, awesome technology behind it. I feel like we get caught up in the fact that because you have all these high quality screens actually emitting the proper light, it's like the perfect blend of what it would actually look like. I hadn't really considered the collaboration side of things before even production begins. Mm -hmm. You know, on these projects, we're doing 3D concepts. We're doing all the 3D concepts in Unreal with all the key creatives, and then we pass that over to the ILM team. But by the time we pass it over, all the tools that they would use in real life were there. So like the director had all his lenses, the DP had his actual lights that he would use in real life replicated in Unreal. The production designer had virtual location scouts. Normally when you go scout a film location, you'll see like a small crowd of people, like a director and a producer and maybe a DP. They're all walking around looking at stuff, taking pictures. But now with virtual production, you can do that with VR headsets. Mm -hmm. so and that's crazy. 
we're working directly with all of them. You're making the movie before you make the movie. Yeah. And then by the time you get to making the movie and you're already on production, you, you can still change it. You're telling me you design the sets before you film? It's like, wait a second, hold on. That's how you're supposed to do it. You design the props, you design the sets, and then you film with them. Versus going, oh, uh, look, we don't have a costume figured out. Just put these polka dots on your chest and dance on the green screen and we'll figure out what the story is, <laughs> like why you're there later. When I yeah. first watched this episode and I saw this room, I was just like, it's a set. I had heard about the volume yeah. and I was like, oh, each time they're on like a crazy sci-fi mountain, it's like the volume because, you know, you can't recreate that. But I look at this and it's like, yeah, you can build a set that looks like that. So I didn't think a single thing of it. And then someone was like, no, that's on one of those stages too. I'm like, what? I was like, you can make that scene in Unreal Engine? This is the way. This is the way. So can you just, as best as you can, start to finish, how do you make the shot? The first thing that happens is obviously we have a kickoff meeting and the kickoff meeting is gonna have the concept art, the idea, the mood. We collaborate on these worlds together. So the set decorator, the production designer, the VFX supervisor, and as we're doing layout, the set decorator is building those crates. In a workshop. In a workshop. With their hands. With their hands, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so they're, they're going, they're building stuff physically, and we're over here building things virtually. So they were like, they're building these props and then kind of the expectation is, cool, you'll bring them to the set and put them on the floor. But you're like, hey, we want to reference them in our virtual set first. So you photo scan them, bring them into the virtual set. And then sometimes when you actually hit photography, the real boxes never even make it in. Yeah. Oh yeah, sometimes they just stay in the virtual world. And then you have the fact that because it's Unreal, and especially with Unreal Engine 5, hopefully this gets even bigger. On the day, if the DP goes, the box, that crate in the back, that red crate is distracting it, maybe make it a gray crate. He still has that call. He can still do that. I feel like that's the magic of shooting <laughs> on a volume because yeah. you get to make those informed decisions yeah. of like, all right, now that I'm actually here looking at it, I've kind of changed my mind. I want to lower the camera a little mm -hmm. bit. That gives a better angle. I wouldn't have known that until I was here looking at it on set, which you would normally do on a real set. But when you're having to do a green screen set, you don't have that there to inform it. So he gets, he gets in a fight here, right? Like he gets jumped. One of the major things that they wanted to do was the reflection of the guy jumping over his helmet. Whoop! Oh, what? Wait, wait, there yeah. it is again, there it is again. What? Wait, how the heck do you do that? We had to do a lot of work in pre-production to see where on the helmet it was gonna happen and make sure that the story beat was gonna come out appropriately. It's beautiful when you see things like this just because it's real. Yeah. Like the reflection is real. That helmet, that shot, it would be so expensive. <laughs> So the dirt's real on the ground. We got some mud. Yes. But then the rocks, none of the rocks are real. Nothing so, above the So the, the first the first layer of rocks, that is on set. The screen is elevated from the ground, so they put stuff there to hide the, the, the screen. Transition. The transition. There's a, there's a scene. Now the stuff that we have in the foreground, those were modeled by a 3D modeler, mm -hmm. and then they were remodeled by a physical modeler, a, a model maker gotcha. on set. And then they may have even been scanned and brought back into Unreal gotcha. so that we can match his look. We're basically getting as close as possible to the final product. The goal here is to be able to hit record on the camera and not have to do anything with that footage after the fact Yes. on a special effects film. Were the LEDs able to do everything or did you need extra lights? absolutely need extra lights. A DP could use all of his traditional lighting. He'll just have to be more mindful of how it affects the screens. Like, let's say he wanted to put a big light over here shooting this way. Would you then have to go in and put that light in the same position in Unreal in mm -hmm. the virtual set? Yeah. There's a couple of nighttime scenes where there's some moonlight. They use these China balls, gigantic looking right. China balls, you know? And so we China recreated moons. those chi China moons in Unreal. <laughs> 
and we are placing them exactly where they would be in real life. Okay. That way they could go and mimic exactly that on the day. It definitely speaks to that concept of like, all right, let's conform these elements here. It's like, yes, we're filming a movie that has a lot of CG, but that doesn't mean we have to disregard all the best practices for capturing images that we've worked on and created over the last hundred years of filmmaking. Definition of virtual production right there. There you go. Bam! <laughs> Best one I've heard today. This is the coolest <laughs> in the whole world, by the way. This is the <laughs> coolest. Okay, let's slip it back and forth a bit. Take the left. <laughs> so now it's time for the subscribe push. Wait, we're skipping subscribe day. It's not like leg day. Yeah, we can skip this day. We don't need to say subscribe every video. <laughs> so we'd like to take a look at a piece from Ian Hubert. He's a good friend of ours and happens to be a blender god. A project he's been working on for three years has just come out and it's brilliant. Let's take a look. This is one of the coolest shots in cinema history. Dude, we're hyping this up. It really is incredible. Ooh, Look at this. Ooh, that's... This is all siege. Nothing is real. I mean, she's real. She, except for her, she's real. Like, good God. The light matching that lighting. She looks phenomenal. And don't forget, she hasn't left the platform that she was standing on the entire time. This is all done on one tiny stage. When she walks out of the apartment, there's already a dude standing off to her left, ready to serve her food. How many people work on this? It was one... basically just him, and his girlfriend is the lead actor. Yeah. Wow. I know, it's funny, it's like, you watch content like this and you're like, oh, it took like two years to make it, and it's like, that's cool. It's like, it was one person. Yeah. Not 200. I just don't, I don't get it. I mean, I've seen projects that take three years that aren't even close to this. We have movies that have hundreds of people that take five years. I think the biggest thing and why this feels real and why Ian's work works so well is his huge use of photo scans and photograph-based textures. And basically, rather than inventing a model from scratch, he uses photos first and then turns those photos into models using that original image as its base texture. So yeah. everything we're seeing here is photographically based at its core. Here, this shot of the, the robot, we're following the robot floating down, all CG, all CG, all CG. And then doof, we got a live action plate there in the background and we're moving up to it and he's managed to transition flawlessly because he's using a combination of the actual handheld movement of him walking up and blending that with his own extra camera movement to make it even bigger. Watching this just gets me jazzed up. That's why, you see how amped we are right now? Is because his stuff is that good. It's just freaking spectacular. Ian actually kind of got famous off of these short little, he calls them lazy tutorials. They're one minute long, and it's basically just Ian being charismatic, teaching people how to use Blender in a very bite-sized way. And it's incredibly entertaining. Oh, wait, Peter. Peter's Peter, here. come here. Is that Peter? Yeah. Just in time, Peter. So obviously you've seen this piece, right? I've seen this piece. It came out two days ago. I've seen it like five times already. That's awesome. This is my third time watching it as well. No competition or anything, but we're gonna give Ian a call and he's gonna come in and give us some insights on how he made it. I just sent this video to all my friends today. Like, you need to watch this. This is amazing. Hey! What's up, Ian? Yo, what up, Ian? How's it going? Oh, it's going good! You guys are all on the couch! Yeah. We are. <laughs> How are you feeling? Oh, man. It feels so good to finally have that thing out there. I'm excited to talk about it. It's been the only thing kind of I've had going for a few years now. <laughs> you obviously have been putting out a lot of YouTube videos over the last few years, but what would you say was the percentage of time on a weekly basis that you would spend on this film versus other stuff? Probably, on average, four hours a day for years. It's hard to know because I flowed a lot of my work making this into tutorials and assets and breakdowns, which I go and I put on like the Patreon or YouTube or something. The making of the thing kind of helped me keep making it. And so I lost all track of time and just kind of went into a crazy work zone. What would you say was the most challenging aspect of making this entire film? I mean, the, the practical stuff for sure. I only do a shoot every six months to a year or so. And so every single time it's like, all right, what can we shoot in like an hour? When it comes to filming, there's a lot to be said for building up a, a headspace and a momentum. It was a really organic process, but again, very, very inefficient. The guy who runs the market, who lives underground, 
Hello. Are you Flow Merchant 9843871739? What the heck is going on with the guy's eyeball? Was that real or is that CG? Well, it's uh it's a real head. We wrapped it in Elmer's glue and toilet paper trying to do like the rotting flesh thing. It didn't work very well. So wait, it's a real head? Yeah, that's my friend Andy Duprowski. <laughs> He's a lot okay. <laughs> but we just filmed him like moving his eyeball around and I froze the rest of the frame. So it's just the one eyeball looking at like the phone him chart. It was like the craziest looking, most disturbing thing. <laughs> What's next? Like, what are your future visions for where this project can go? Is there an episode two in the works? The biggest goal is figure out how to do whatever I can to make it take less than three years. Because if my complete output is like 45 minutes per decade, I wanted to make more than that. I'm really trying to figure out whether it's, you know, real-time virtual production stuff or uh, just a lot more emphasis on practical sets, a way to try to keep that same level of world building, but without having to spend years making it all in, in post. Virtual production the way because then you control the whole vision <laughs> so now the question is when are you going to come visit us so that you could be sitting here on the couch as well as soon as possible <laughs> it's it's so impressive and beautiful thanks for making it man and thanks for sharing it with everyone yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on good to good to see you guys take care man see you oh, yeah. peace guys i've got the beat in my head because today's episode sponsor is raycon earbuds one of my favorite sponsors on this channel they are effing champions. Raycons have all of the bells and whistles that you would expect from any other premium wireless audio solution. They have six hours of playtime. They have a rechargeable carrying case that you can easily slide into your pocket and take with you and recharge your earbuds when you're on the go. They have more bass. I think they have a better, more compact design that's sleeker, it's more stylish, and of course it creates a nice noise isolating fit whenever you're wearing them. They have a variety of fun colors and patterns. Maybe your favorite color is red. Okay, well guess what? They got red ones, pretty sweet. And they do all of this without any dangling stems or wires. This is because they focus on the customer experience first from start to finish. So anyways, if you guys are interested, head on over to buyraycon.com slash corridor crew and you can get 15% off your purchase. They're a great earbud to include in your daily routine. And I'm super glad that they continually sponsor this show. Just wanted to let you guys know, once again, don't go out and buy them on your own. Use the link in the description below and get that 15% off. And um, anyways, tell your friends. I don't know. Watch the rest of the episode. I don't know. I don't know where we go from here. Nick's gonna make that call. I don't. I don't. I don't make those kind of calls. It's above my pay grade. But anyways, well, see you later. Felix, yeah. thank you so much for coming on, man. I really yeah. appreciate it. It was fun having you here. This was super fun. Where can we find more information about your company? If you'd like to learn more, just go to happymushroom.com. That's it. All, All right. right. Easy. Sweet. Super easy. Thank you for sharing these stories and like your insight and how all this stuff is being put together because we're all super jazzed about it too. Guys, thank you for having me. Oh, also thank you for the premiere tickets to the next Star Wars film. I really oh, yeah. appreciate that. Totally. Yeah. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God.